don't often let myself look at the pictures that you just saw of me, the before pictures. The strong, physically active, carefree me, who used to love to climb mountains and play tennis and cycle hundreds of miles. When I look at her, I know that she doesn't know what it's like to lift her head off the pillow in the morning with a weak neck. She doesn't know what it's like to struggle to tie her own shoes. And she doesn't know what it's like to watch her muscles slowly waste away from her body. I look at those pictures and it feels like a memorial. And I want to remember her today. I want to grieve what HIBM has taken from me already. I want to fight for all the people who are still taking their before pictures. The future patients who are still climbing mountains and have no idea what their futures hold. I want to tell you about what it feels like to watch my body slowly deteriorate. And then I want to talk about how together we can stop this disease. When I spoke at this conference three years ago, I talked extensively about my pre-disease life. I shared what it felt like the moment my world fell apart almost nine years ago at age 30, when I was told that I had a progressively debilitating neuromuscular disease with no approved treatment or cure. I talked about the trauma of hearing that I have a disease that on average leads to severe incapacitation within 10 to 15 years of its onset. I shared my fears about what it would be like to be disabled. But as I stand here today, having watched HIBM steal my physical strength even more in the last three years, with my old life shrinking farther away in my rearview mirror, I realize that I can't give that talk anymore. For me, it's no longer about the fear of what's to come, but rather the pain of what is already here. I no longer wonder what it will mean to be disabled. I am disabled. And I used to only be able to say that word in a whisper, but now I have to say it out loud every day. What felt like tremendous losses in the beginning, like no longer being able to wear high heels or no longer being able to run, now seems so superficial and insignificant. And when the losses became more limiting, like not being able to lift my younger son or not being able to leave the house without my leg braces, it was even more devastating, but still, I was able to adjust and adapt. I just kept recalibrating my scale of what mattered. But now, progression is taking on a whole new meaning, like needing to use a cane, or having trouble cutting my food with a knife and fork in the way that I've always been able to. The pain in accepting this new level of progression is so much harder and requires so much more energy to hold on to my emotional baseline. I'm constantly investing energy in trying to stay present and engaged in the moment. But I know that this disease is a one-way street and the losses that I'm enduring now will not be regained. And the hardest part is knowing, is knowing that I'm relatively still at the beginning of this disease. When I was here three years ago, I remember having trouble deciding whether or not I should wear my leg braces up to the podium. Back then, it was still a choice. Today, it's a requirement. I'm losing choices every day and seeing direct objective evidence of my progression. It is terrifying and it's overwhelming. But if you think what I'm dealing with sounds scary, let me tell you what patients who are currently, patients who um, are currently struggling with, what patients who discuss, what they discuss on the HIBM patient forum support group. Patients asking if they should go right into an electric wheelchair because their upper bodies are probably going to be too weak to push a manual one for much longer. Discussions about where to buy dress shirts with Velcro instead of buttons because becoming fastening buttons is becoming too difficult. Discussions about which mattresses or adjustable beds relieve pressure during the night and permit patients to sleep independently without needing the help of a spouse or a caregiver to turn them over. Patients sharing the kind of emergency alert bracelets they wear when they, that they wear for when they fall to the floor alone in their homes and there's no one there to help them get up. This is what lurks in the shadows for me. This is what keeps me up at night. We are adults who've been struck by tragedy in the prime of our lives. We are forced to let go of the lives we thought we were going to live and come to terms with the lives right in front of us. We live in fear of the day that we will no longer recognize ourselves, 
when we can no longer make adjustments that enable us to continue working or participating in our lives in the ways that we cherish now. And that is just one layer of this cruel and merciless disease. HIBM is such an ultra rare orphan disease that most people, including most physicians, have never even heard of it. Like so many rare diseases, for some patients, this often means years of needless invasive procedures and misdiagnoses just to arrive at an accurate diagnosis. And not only is HIBM a devastating disease, barely known to the medical community, but after diagnosis, there's a helplessness that sets in because there is not one single approved treatment available at this time. We can't even look to our fellow patients for reassurance because there is no typical course of progression of this disease. There are 19-year-olds in wheelchairs, and there are 59-year-olds still walking with canes. There are so many more questions and answers in this disease. But one truth that we can all agree on is that once muscle tissue is lost, it cannot be regenerated. I often talk a lot about the emotional pain of HIVM because it's such an integral part of living with this disease. But I want to tell you more about what it's like to live in this body. In the morning, I rarely wake up having slept all night uninterrupted. Whether I wake up in the middle of the night because a part of my body has fallen asleep, not having the strength to spontaneously shift around, and I have to vigorously shake out my muscles, or because no matter how I try to strategically place the pillows, I can't get comfortable, I usually wake up feeling tired. I no longer sleep on my back because of some mild sciatica symptoms that I've developed. I stopped sleeping on my left side a few years ago because my left shoulder and upper back muscles are so atrophied to the point that my whole shoulder essentially collapses on my side under me. So that has left me to sleep on my right side, which is becoming increasingly challenging as my right shoulder and upper back seem to be going the way of my left. When I do wake up, there's a momentary remembering that I am still inside the same body and then a momentary panic as I wonder how I will continue to wake up in the same body for presumably decades to come. I immediately take a mental inventory of what's still working and what's not. I try to wiggle my toes or make a fist with my left hand, though I know that it's futile, just wishes that I fantasize about and test out every day. Then I hear one of my two boys and I know I have to drag myself out of bed. I place my hand behind my head since my neck no longer offers my head the support and the strength to hold it up when sitting. I feel the, so the, the soreness in my shoulders and tightness in my lower back. And I put my feet on the floor and half the time I fall right back onto my bed because I don't, can't maintain my balance. My calf muscles are so tight that before I try to take a step, I hold onto my dresser and stretch out my calves as best I can. And then finally, I take the first of many wobbly, uncertain, anxiety-provoking steps that I will take throughout my day until I return to my bed at night to start over all over again. My pre-disease self would then zip in and out of the bathroom before officially starting my day. But now simple, formerly mindless tasks, like stepping into the shower and hoping that my foot clears the step, shampooing my hair, squeezing out toothpaste, clipping my own nails, holding a blow dryer in one hand and a brush in the other, have become time consuming and frustrating. I can still do them, but not only are they effortful, they serve as depressing foreshadows of how much progressively harder the rest of my life will be. When it comes time to leave the house, I have to find my leg braces, take them out of the shoes they are in and slide them into the insole of another pair. Because I now have a bilateral complete foot drop, I no longer have the strength to flex my feet, and they essentially flop around like dead stumps attached to my legs. So I wear braces like so many other HIBM patients, but what people may not realize is that although the braces are effective for the foot drop, they do nothing for my ankle instability, calf weakness, almost non-existent hamstrings, my deteriorated hip strength, and of course, all of my upper body weakness. Not only are they uncomfortable after a long day on my feet, but if you told me that I would only need to wear these leg braces for the rest of my life, that this would be as disabled as I would get, I would celebrate. Once I'm out in the world, there's a vulnerability that sets in, both physically and emotionally. 
I don't get to choose whether or not I want to have my guard up or down like so many others. There is no way to hide or mask what my struggles are or the ways in which I am limited by my body. They are always on display. There's a certain vulnerability I feel with strangers and a different one I feel with loved ones. With strangers, I'm vulnerable when all the other moms running late for pickup hurriedly jot up the slight in kind into school while I'm left behind, slowly shuffling my way up, feeling the stares of pity and confusion on me while reconciling my own frustration and anger at not being able to move in the most basic and simplest way. I'm vulnerable when I decide to join the fancy gym near my office, even though I know it means regularly walking into a room full of beautiful muscular people, watching their bodies get stronger while I clumsily drag myself across the room to pick up weights that are progressively dropping in pounds the more time I spend at the gym. I'm vulnerable when I'm escorted through the airport in a wheelchair alongside fellow wheelchair passengers who are usually more than twice my age or when I'm holding up the line in my car entering the mall parking lot because I don't have the finger strength to pull the ticket out of the ticket machine. With loved ones, my vulnerability is more painful. Like when I see the looks of concern and worry through my husband's reassuring smile as he gently helps me up after I've fallen hard onto the floor, or when I catch a glimpse of the fear in my parents' eyes as they watch me try to navigate my world. And then, of course, most devastating for me is with my two sweet boys. When my seven-year-old casually says, you're slow, mommy, or you're not strong, mommy, I say, you're right, but I'm strong in my mind and in my heart. And when he hopes out loud, maybe if you exercise enough, you could be strong like me. Or when he asks, well, we need to give back the disability placard once you're better. My heart breaks it. It is clear that he doesn't know that this will never happen for me. He doesn't know that this is the strongest that I will be, that I will only get weaker, that these will have been my best years living with this disease. He doesn't know that one day I may be sitting in a wheelchair. My boys are so young, so innocently unaware of the cruelty of this disease. Right now, they just think that mommy walks slowly and isn't as strong as the other mommies. But for how long will they watch me lose my balance and fall to the ground and not see through my attempts to reassure them that I'm fine? How long before they understand that I am not fine? I continue to struggle with what it means for my boys to have to watch their mother physically deteriorate at such a young age. There is an increasing sense of urgency among the patient community. As our muscles waste away, so does our patience. Though we are not dying, our bodies slowly are. We have families and careers and futures that we want to salvage. We don't have the benefit of being a well-known disease, like hypertension or high cholesterol that pharmaceutical companies spend billions of dollars on. And if only we could control the course of our disease with diet and exercise. Instead, we are 100% dependent on you, on your research, to spare us from our fates. We can't even express the gratitude the HIBM patient community has for people in this room. Knowing that you are working tirelessly on our disease, on our orphan disease, quite simply means everything to us, and we thank you. We thank you for being our hope. Soon after I was diagnosed, my family and close friends formed the Neuromuscular Disease Foundation, a nonprofit whose mission has been to raise awareness and encourage testing for HIBM and to direct funding to scientists around the world who are working to find a treatment or cure. Since its start in 2006, NDF has raised over a million dollars. NDF has been instrumental in recruiting patients for the ongoing ultragenics and upcoming NIH clinical trials. But the studies and clinical trials that are already in place are not enough. We need to do more. We need fresh ideas. We need to think outside the box to start to consider novel therapies. The clock ticks loudly for us. We can't ignore it. We can't silence it. We hear it in the darkness of the night as we desperately try to find a comfortable position in which to fall asleep. 
and we are jarred awake by it every morning when we open our eyes and realize that we are still in our same bodies. We are desperate and we look to you for help. On behalf of the Neuromuscular Disease Foundation and my fellow HIBM patients, I thank you for understanding that time is of the essence. Thank you.